Uh, life is one long tale of the unexpected. I mean, it would be really dull if we knew exactly what was going to happen tomorrow and the next day and the day after that. It's the fact that we don't know how things are going to turn out that makes our lives both exciting on the one hand and a bit anxious and unnerving on the other. So, for example, we never know when we're going to lose our prime minister or, or get a new one for that matter. We never quite know which Queensland team's going to show up to play in New South Wales. Life's unpredictable. And that's why people watch The Voice and The Block and MasterChef and The Great Australian Bake Off. It's not knowing how things are going to end that produces a strange mixture of excitement and, and anxiety for our favorite singer or baker or candidate or team. That's what makes us keep watching. More seriously, we feel the same mixture of excitement and anxiety when we think about our own future. We just don't know how things are going to turn out. Sometimes it seems that the future's bright and everything's going to finally fall into place for us. At other points, it looks much more likely that everything's about to go wrong and our lives are on the point of collapsing into chaos. You know, if we've got children, sometimes we look at them and we're almost overwhelmed by their potential and amazing possibilities stretching out before them. At other times, we think we'll be doing well if we keep them out of the juvenile offender center for another few weeks. We, we, we all know that our lives are tales of the unexpected, whether it's our, our lives as individuals or the life of our city or, for that matter, the life of our church family here at MPC. So how do we cope with this tale of the unexpected that we're all living in? How do we make sure that we don't panic, that we're not paralyzed by anxiety? How do we make sure we don't become miserable pessimists on the one hand or completely incurable optimists on the other? How, how do we cope? Well, that's where Acts 16 comes in. Because in this chapter, God gives us a very simple template for staying on track as passionate, humble, God-honoring people and churches made up of people like that in a world where we never know what's around the corner. As the new team of Paul and Silas retraces the route that Paul and Barnabas has taken in Acts 13 and 14, encouraging the new churches that they planted, the first thing that happens is that they meet this young guy called Timothy. They weren't looking for him. They weren't expecting to pick up a third team member. But sometimes that's just how God works. And that's how this tale of the unexpected begins. Look with me, if you will, at what Luke writes in Acts 16, verses 1 to 3. Paul came to Derby and then Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewess and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The brothers there spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him on the journey. So he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew his father was a Greek. Now, why does Luke bother to include this rather personal and painful detail? How come Timothy's minor surgery gets into the history of the church? It's because Luke wants us to get the fact that if we're to live for Jesus in our unpredictable world, then sometimes we need to be, able, be ready to do whatever it takes to get the message out into our community. Timothy came from a really unusual background. His dad wasn't a Christian, nor was he a Jew. His dad was a fully paid up pagan. And it seems that he put his foot down and said, uh, no one was going to circumcise his little boy at eight days old. So even though Timothy's mom was Jewish, which technically made him Jewish, he hadn't been circumcised. So in the eyes of other Jewish people, Timothy was the worst of both worlds. He was a renegade. He was what they called an apostate. He was like a Queenslander who opted to play for New South Wales. So, so Paul suggests that to make an honest Jew of Timothy so that no one can, can accuse any of them of being anti-Jewish, he should have his minor surgery. Timothy says, okay, because he knows it will be easy, easier for them to get the message of the gospel across. So Timothy undergoes minor surgery for the sake of the gospel. Now, it may not be necessary for all of us to rush out and try to book some elective surgery this week for the sake of Jesus, but if we are followers of Jesus, it's vital that we recommit to doing whatever it takes to get the message of Jesus out into our community. That's just part of the deal. That's what we're here for. If we belong to him, we need to get on with it. It's not really all that complicated. Um, I need to get a bit fitter at the minute, so what do I have to do? Every morning I have to get out of bed, put my running shoes on, go for a run. The garden's in a bit of a mess. 
The weeds are everywhere. What do I have to do? I have to get down on my hands and knees, get to work. The electricity bill has come in. What do I do? Well, I don't know about you, but I am tempted just to leave it on the desk and pretend like it doesn't exist, but I can't do that. I go online, I suffer the pain, I type in a ridiculous number of numbers, and I hit enter. See, in lots of areas of our lives, we just do what we have to do, at least when it's really important. So the opening verses of Acts 16 make it really plain that when it comes to the gospel, we have to do what we have to do. We do whatever it takes to get the message out. So one overriding principle should dominate our life together. We need to keep asking, will this help us to get the message of Jesus out into our community so that he is honored? Now, there is a slight problem with that. It takes all of us out of our comfort zone. But you know what? That's no bad thing. Because there's nothing more toxic to us as we try to live for Jesus than the air in our own comfort zone. So what might we have to do to get the message out? I don't know. Okay? We might have to sell our buildings and buy a tent. We might have to up sticks and move to the community down the road. We might have to start meeting at 3 a.m. on Wednesday mornings. We might have to start running services in Swahili. We might have to go back to singing unaccompanied psalms to reach the immigrant Scottish population. Uh, We might have to find the money to buy all the houses on Ruby Road or employ 10 more staff. We might have to move and build a cathedral in Capera. Who knows? (laughs) It doesn't actually matter what we have to do. What matters is that we're prepared to do it for the sake of the gospel. But more than that, what about us as individuals? Let's commit right now again to doing whatever it takes as individuals to keep pointing the people we know to the Lord Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but but for me, the idea of talking to anyone about Jesus is often just about as attractive as minor surgery. In fact, to be honest, having minor surgery would probably seem easier than talking to someone about Jesus. There are very few of us for whom it's really easy and natural to keep talking to other people about Jesus. It's not easy for Timothy. We find that out later in the New Testament. But sometimes a man's got to do what a man's got to do. And yes, we shouldn't be sharing the gospel out of guilt or merely a sense of duty, but we really should be doing it. Let me ask you a couple of blunt questions. Are you praying regularly and specifically for a short list of people you know who aren't Christians? Do you have that that mental note in your head? Do, Do you have an actual piece of paper? If you don't, it might be a good idea to have one. Are you asking God to give you more of his love for them so that you actually want to talk to your friends about Jesus more than you want to feel comfortable? Are we actually praying this week for, for chances to tell people about how marvelous Jesus is? Paul says it's something we've got to do because as he says elsewhere, Christ's love compels us. What Jesus has done for us if we're Christians leaves us with no option but to get the message across to other people to bake, to play sport, to change your routine, to listen, to share meals, to care, to call, to email, to say sorry, to move ice, to learn, above, above all else, to speak, but to do it all for the sake of the gospel so that people find out more about Jesus. That's the first thing we need to do. And according to 16 verse 5, it's in that simple act that the churches across, that through that, the churches across Turkey are strengthened in the faith and grow daily in numbers. Because Timothy, along with everybody else, was willing to do whatever it took to get the gospel out. Second thing we need to remember that just jumps out of this passage, you need to remember that God knows best. I don't know if you picked it up as Phil read it, but in Acts 16, 6 to 10, something really odd happens. You know, I think this is the only place I can find in the New Testament where God actually stops people from spreading the good news about Jesus. Can you imagine, you know, that we got a special message from God saying this morning, okay, that's it. No more pointing anybody to Jesus. Just stop talking. Effectively, that's what happens. Paul and his companions, verse 6, travel through the regions of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. So then they try to go somewhere else. The Spirit of Jesus wouldn't allow them to. So, slightly mystified, they go down to Troas. Luke doesn't tell us how the Holy Spirit did this. 
Doesn't tell us whether Paul and Silas realized immediately what's happened. Doesn't even spell out whether they were tearing their hair out or not. But he does make it clear that what looked like a huge setback to God's mission was actually a crucial step forward. It really looked like Jesus had let them down. But in fact, Jesus was working through the Spirit to ensure that the message of Jesus moved into a new continent for the first time. Now, now this is really, really important. God knows what he's doing. God knows better than us. The church belongs to him, and he knows and cares more about it than we do, and he's promised to build his church. So whatever we do, no matter what mistakes we make, no matter what setbacks we face, no matter what trouble we run into, no matter what bad decisions we make, no matter what practical problems we face, God knows better than we do. And God delights in surprising us and turning around the most unpromising situations to do exciting new things, which is exactly what happens next. Verse 9, during the night, Paul is a vision of a man in Macedonia, across the water, standing and begging him, come and help us. So they get up the next morning, off they go. Now this stretch of water had always been significant. You'll see it on the map on the screen. It was originally called the Hellespont. It was once a Persian leader called Xerxes who strapped boats together to enable his army to walk across it. It's here that Alexander the Great crossed to go on the rampage across most of the rest of the world. Later, the name was changed to the Dardanelles, and it was here that the Battle of Gallipoli was fought in the First World War. But you know, there's never been a more important moment than this on this short stretch of water. Paul and, and Silas probably accompanied by Luke, quietly get on a boat and they sail into Europe. When they get there, they do as they always do, go to the most important city, Philippi, verse 12. Now, you see, they do plan. They do make strategic decisions which they believe will have the greatest impact on the gospel. They they don't stop in every hole in the hedge on this journey. They go to the major population centers on the basis that the best way to reach the whole region is to start in the place where most people are, the place to which most people travel. Planning and strategy is really important for them, but it's not the final word because sometimes they see that God works in ways which defy our best attempts to be wise and strategic. God knows best. See, there's a marvelous balance here. On the one hand, they think and work hard to get the gospel out in what seems to be the most effective way possible. But there's also the basic acknowledgement that sometimes God works in ways which may not seem the most strategic to us. See, if it had been left to Paul and Silas, southern Turkey would have been evangelized really, really effectively. But who knows when people north of the Hellespont in Europe would have heard the message? Now, maybe a little bit of a jump here, but if it hadn't been for this moment when the message went into Europe, it may have been maybe that the message would never have actually got to Australia. So we do actually have some big connection with what goes on here as God intervenes. Paul didn't see that. They were just going around Turkey. But, Paul, but God forces him across the Hellespont into Europe and beyond. So what's God saying to us through this part of the Bible? Of course, we need to plan and dream and work to get the message out as individuals and as as a church family. But we also need to remember that God knows better than us. And sometimes in God's wisdom, he will open up new possibilities for us that we hadn't even dreamed of. Sometimes God will allow some things we try to fail. Sometimes God may stop us from doing things so that something else may flourish down the track. Let's remember, we don't have all the answers. We can't do this by ourselves, but we don't need to because we have a God who knows better than we do. You don't need me to tell you, sometimes life's really disappointing. Sometimes things fall into place so easily. Sometimes they don't. For some of us, life just appears to be a cakewalk. For others, it's nothing but struggle. What on earth is God doing in this? He's doing what he always does. He is working for your good and my good and for his glory. And sometimes we just need to say, you know what? I'm going to believe God when he says he knows what he's doing, even though it makes no sense at all to me. Why should it do that? Because God knows better than I do. Whether we're talking about our lives as individuals or as a church family or sovereign, God knows best. 
And then let's expect God to change people's lives through the gospel. From around the time of Jesus on, male Jews were encouraged to pray every morning, thank you, God, that you haven't made me a woman, a slave, or a Gentile. Still part of some Jewish synagogue liturgies today. But what happens when Paul and Silas get to Philippi? God transforms the lives of a woman, a slave, and a Gentile. They're pretty unlikely people. I mean, say Gina Reinhart, kind of Lady Gaga, and Paul Gallen, you know? On, on the surface, at least, now I don't know any of these people individually, but on the surface, at least, they don't strike me as people who are just itching to become Christians, okay? Each of them is fairly unlikely. But whatever else this part of Acts is here to do, it's here to say everyone needs Jesus and God can change anyone. Or to turn it around, we have every right to expect God to change people's lives through the message of the gospel. That's what we see through the, the rest of this narrative that Phil read. Lydia is a rich and successful woman, but the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. The slave girl's trapped and God sets her free. The jailer thinks his life is over when all his prisoners are escaped. But God works through the message of the gospel to bring him salvation. Luke wants us to see that God breaks into the lives of these three outsiders to show us that this is the kind of thing that happens when God is at work. Okay. Some people will become Christians, and it's not necessarily the people we expect. Lydia, she, was, she wasn't a fully-fledged Jew, but she was a Gentile who'd come to believe in the, the God of the Old Testament. She took religion seriously enough to go out of the city every Saturday to meet with a small group of women who met to read the Bible. How did she become a Christian? It's not because Paul was brilliant at explaining the message. It's because, verse 14, God opened her heart. The slave girl completely messed up. Paul's on the way to meet this Riverside Growth Group in verse 16 when he meets this girl who literally has the spirit of Python. Um, the Greeks said that people like this girl were possessed by the spirit of a giant python which guarded the temple of Apollo at Delphi. They called them ventriloquists because they randomly made predictions in all kinds of strange and foreign voices. Uh, if you've read the Harry Potter books, I suspect this is where uh, J.K. Rowling got some of her ideas. But, but this strange girl is being a pain. She's following Paul and the others around. She's just yelling at them. These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you a way to be saved over and over and over again. Now, perhaps Paul was having a bad day. Perhaps he was tired, but eventually, not to put too fine a point on it, he tells her to shut up. Okay, really. You'd think Paul would say something like, or that Luke would say, Paul moved with compassion turned to her and said, you poor soul, in the name of Jesus, I have what you need. But it doesn't say that. She's just walking right after Paul, yelling in his ear, and eventually Paul gets so fed up that he just says, look, would you shut up? Would the spirit come out of you? And it does. She's suddenly healed, brought to freedom. I think this is the grumpiest miracle in the Bible, okay? God, it seems, can work through us even when we get rabbi. I suspect Paul himself always retold this story with a bit of a wry smile. God rescued her, not through Paul's love or his words, but because of his own mercy and power. The problem is, of course, her owners are none too pleased. Having been just robbed of their money-spending fairground attraction, they set on Paul and Silas, who end up in jail. What happens next? Incredible. The irrepressible Paul, who by this stage has got over his grumpy patch, is singing in jail at midnight. God intervenes, jail explodes, they're all set free. Just imagine, everyone's getting ready to, to run out cheering. Paul says, no, stay there, just, just, just wait. Wait, wait, and they're going, come on, Paul, come on, we can get out of here, this is our chance. Paul's going, no, no. Then he calls for the jailer who's just about to fall on his sword. And God changes this grizzled veteran's life. Now, the greatest miracle in this part of the passage isn't the exploding jail. It's the repentant jailer. And for the jailer, it's not the earthquake that moves him. It's the fact that Paul is still there. He then asks the best question in the whole of the New Testament. What must I do to be saved? And I guess the simplest answer, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. 
In fact, your whole family can be transformed by Jesus. So they did, and they were. And then you get that marvelous little footnote to this story with, where Paul, clearly having regained his sense of humor, says, uh, no, no, I'm not leaving the jail until I get an apology. <laughs> and so he does. A rich and powerful woman, fortune-telling slave girl, a battle-hardened ex-Roman soldier who'd retired to Philippi and was earning some extra cash by running the local prison. Great raw material for a church plant. Crack troops, all obvious new converts. Not really. <laughs> but then God has always made a habit of defying our expectations in the people in whom he chooses to work. You want evidence? Just look around. We have every right to expect God to change people's lives through the gospel. Why? Because he changed us. Uh, sometimes I think it's fairly remarkable that uh, a guy from a nondescript town uh, in, in a small province in a country a very long way away is, is in Brisbane. Okay? Never mind working in a theological college. There are quite a lot of kind of big steps that it has taken to get me here. You know what? That's nothing. <laughs> because the living God has rescued each one of us who belongs to the Lord Jesus and given, given us new life. That's the miracle. Now, now, just for a moment, think about the person you know who's least likely to become a Christian just now. I can think of a few candidates. I know a lot of people who are unlikely to become Christians. I can think of a friend of mine who studiously avoids not, any, not only any conversation about God, but any conversation which he thinks might lead to a conversation about God. I've got a friend who thinks he's far too smart to be a Christian. I've got a next-door neighbor who couldn't be less interested in anything remotely connected with Christianity. I know some people who are making lifestyle choices that mean they're a million miles from the kind of thing that God talks about in the Bible. I know really, I know loads and loads of people who are unlikely to become, become Christians. But you know the great news? None of them is beyond God's reach. And more than that, some of them will become Christians. If you and I keep getting the message of Jesus out to people like them, not because we're brilliant friends, not because we're particularly convincing when we speak, not because we're just so loving, but because God loves to change people, even the most unlikely people. And how does he do it? He does it as he chooses, through a simple explanation of the message that someone has been waiting for, through the Spirit dramatically setting people free, through simple actions that open the way up for us to speak, our God changes people through the message of the gospel, and we can expect our lives together to be punctuated by tales of the unexpected. So what do we need to do in the light of this part of the Bible? Well, three things. So let's do them. Let, let's do whatever it takes to get the message of Jesus out in Mitchelton and Everton Park and Arana Hills and Capera and Ashgrove and Fernie Hills and Bunyan, the Gap and Stafford and McDowell and everywhere else in between we get the chance to. Let's remember that God knows better than we do. So that even though we must think and plan, he knows best and at points he will surprise us. And let's expect God to change people's lives through the gospel. Let me put it like this and then stop. Well, what do we need if together we are, we are to flourish in the next 10, 20, 30 years? Well, we do need passion for God because only then will we be willing to do what it takes to get the message out. We need humility before God because only then will we be ready to hold our hands up and say sometimes, you know, I don't have a clue what to do. Only God knows. And we need confidence in God as we actually expect him to make a real difference in our lives and other people's lives through the gospel. We need passion and humility and confidence. Where do we get it? Do we turn the lights out? No, close our eyes, grit our teeth, repeat to ourselves, I must become more passionate more humble, more confident. Well, we could, but it wouldn't work. Because the only thing that can produce real passion and real humility and real confidence in God is the message of the gospel itself as the Holy Spirit uses it, uses it to change us. The key to our future is this message. It's not just the message we take to other people. It's the message we need to survive ourselves because this is how God produces passion and humility and confidence. This is how God changes people like us. This is how God changes all people. 
He does it through the message of Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who died and rose again for us, the one who said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it.